Thank you very much. Uh, I'm, I'm honored to be able to introduce, <laughs> thank you. I'm honored to be able to introduce Representative Dan Kildee of Michigan. I became familiar with his work uh, a few years ago when I was asked to help out analyze what's going on at one of our bases in the state of Michigan that uh, in, it's called Wirtsmith um, Base. And there I became aware of a very significant issue with contamination associated with these PFAS compounds, which is the subject of the Dark Waters trailer we saw earlier today in Rob Balat's work, who's uh, one of the board members of Less Cancer. And uh, Representative Kildee, I'm so thankful for the work he's doing on Capitol Hill for all of us introducing important legislation to address these issues uh, and fighting the good fight, even though there's not a lot we're able to get done sometimes. <laughs> it's very frustrating, but he has definitely been uh, on the forefront of this issue, protecting our drinking water and pushing forth uh, work in the PFAS task force that was formed in Congress. And I'd like to uh, welcome him to the stage today. Thank you. Well, thank you um, for inviting me to be here. And yeah, this, is, this works better for me, just in case I go rogue. You never know. No one's safe out there. Um, but I want to thank Mindy for that introduction, but for, for all of her uh, work. It seems like everywhere I show up to work on issues regarding PFAS, uh, Mindy's there. And that's what it's going to take. Obviously, people like her who, you know, been a real champion on this long before anybody even knew how to spell PFAS. Um, so I came to this issue um, because of the, a contamination in my own home district. And just to give it a bit of context, you know, I was elected to Congress in 2012. I am a, uh, a child of Flint, Michigan, uh, born and raised in Flint. Uh, graduated from high school there. Actually got elected to public office um, when I was 18 years old in Flint, Michigan. Uh, more than a decade ago. <laughs> Just want to see if you're listening. Um, 43 years ago to the school board there. So Flint is in my DNA. And I came to understand exactly the threat that communities face <clears throat> around drinking water, something that we all almost naturally take for granted as being safe uh, with the, the uh, Flint water crisis. And that's where I got to know one of the individuals associated with this organization, uh, Dr. Mona Hanna Atisha. She and I worked together um, on the Flint water crisis from the very beginning. And it was her groundbreaking work on uh, blood samples of children in Flint that really blew the cover off that crisis. Um, Little did I know that that would not be the only drinking water crisis that I would face, nor did I really understand fully that drinking water and water generally uh, is, a, is a crisis in this country that most people don't even know exists. One of the threats was the threat that was the second crisis to come to me, and it was uh, the contamination of drinking water, groundwater, surface water in Ascoda, Michigan, a small town at the very northern tip of my district. 120 miles away from Flint. Uh, but it's a community that hosted the Wordsmith Air Force Base, as Mindy mentioned, a base that closed you know, more than a quarter of a century ago, but still lives with the legacy of having hosted that base. Um, PFAS chemicals are used in lots of different applications. Some of you may be familiar with it. Uh, but it, it's a chemical compound it's highly durable and is used in waterproofing, fireproofing, lots of other manufacturing applications. And what we know, sadly, is that it's, it's ubiquitous in the environment. We are very familiar with its use on military bases because it's used in firefighting foam. And that's what happened in Ascoda. With continued training for fires on the base, and an actual fire in one case. Lots of PFAS was sprayed through foam on the ground and leached into the groundwater and came to us because it contaminated the drinking water of people who were living in Ascoda and depending on well water. 
And so we felt, we felt like, well, we got to take this on. And we didn't, at that point, see it as anything much beyond sort of the typical work we do advocating for a community that I represent. We didn't see it in its larger context until about a day after getting into this and realizing this is huge. This is potentially a huge uh, problem. So these forever chemicals are everywhere. There are about 400 military sites that we know PFAS has likely led to significant contamination of surface water, groundwater, and potentially drinking water. But innumerable private sites where PFAS is likely contaminating people who don't even know it. You know, it's interesting because in Michigan, if you look at, you can go to some of the sites, uh, some of the advocacy organizations and others that are working on PFAS issues, you can look at a map, a scattershot map of sites where we know we have PFAS. You'll see a bunch of them concentrated in New Hampshire. You'll see a bunch of them concentrated in Michigan. You would think, my gosh, what's going on in Michigan? I'll tell you what's going on in Michigan. We're looking for it, and that's why we're finding it. We don't have any greater prevalence of PFAS, likely, than just about any other place in the country that has a legacy of either military bases or industry or some combination thereof. Um, so it's, it's everywhere. And it's really dangerous stuff. Another one of your um, associates, I think a board member, is Rob Balat. In fact, I see Rob's book. We were just chatting about that. You know, Rob is one of the real champions, um, representing the people of Parkersburg, which was like really the biggest first massive contamination that was well understood. Um, Rob went to bat for those folks and took on uh, the, the chemical polluters. Ended up in an interesting resolution um, settlement with DuPont where the settlement essentially said, we're going to dig deep on this. It's not just going to be a monetary settlement. We're going to dig deep on this and find out what the effect of PFAS really is on human health. One of the most, maybe the most exhaustive human health studies ever done, 68,000 people participating in this study, led to the conclusion, which ought to have been you know, the hypothesis, that these dangerous chemicals that are so resistant that they can withstand incredibly high heat that they're not good for people to consume. And while these sort of anecdotes of terrible disease in Parkersburg were obvious, the data that that C8 study ended up demonstrating shows that there are lots of threats to human health that PFAS represents, including cancer. And that's where you all come in. And that's why it's so important that we have this conversation. So, you know, as Mindy said, we started off, you know how these things work, you know, we, we started off just screaming into the wind on this. Nobody even knew anything about this. I would go to members of Congress and ask them about PFAS, and they'd look at me like I had three heads. And this was only a year ago when we launched this bipartisan PFAS task force. We put out the call. Anybody who is dealing with PFAS contamination, join this bipartisan effort. And in the first month, we were thrilled that 15 members of Congress came forward. I mean, we didn't know what we would get. But it, 15 members came forward. Now we have over 50. Why is that? Because of the actions of organizations like this one. The thing that will make the difference on PFAS, that will get us the policy tools to protect people from it, to require cleanup, the difference is going to be public awareness. You know, uh, public sentiment's everything, as Speaker Pelosi often quotes Abraham Lincoln as having said. With it, you can accomplish almost anything. Without it, almost nothing. The way that we've been able to get momentum, modest momentum so far, admittedly, around dealing with this really significant environmental threat 
is because more and more people in states like New Hampshire, like Michigan, and other places are becoming aware that it's there. We don't need to do much more than educate people about the threat to their lives and to their children. They will take advocacy seriously when they know that this threat is real. So that's our, that's our job. That's our responsibility. That's sort of on us. And it's starting to bear some fruit. I'll just mention a couple of things. So this PFAS task force, um, you know, we had, um, every year we, just about every year, pass uh, something called the Defense Authorization Act. It's the bill that authorizes and funds the U.S. military. And because the U.S. military is the biggest known specific polluter, this was an ideal place for us to put some PFAS legislation. And so the group of us that had been working on this had all sorts of bills that we were able to get onto the House version of the Defense Act. This is a little bit wonky, but it's really important to know how this stuff is going to play out. The House version of the Defense Bill included a lot of really good PFAS provisions. Some of the stuff that I had written and introduced as separate bills, but critically, one that would require EPA to develop, develop and enforce a drinking water standard based on science, which we don't have. We have a health advisory that says this really dangerous stuff, whose threat is measured in the parts per trillion, is not regulated in drinking water. We said in the defense bill it has to be. And then also categorized a couple of the specific compounds, more prevalent compounds, under CERCLA to require or to give us the tools to require polluters to clean up the mess that they've made. Two really important pieces. We're celebrating, taking a little bit of a high five victory lap as we pass this bill through the House. And like most good ideas, when it went over to the Senate, which is where good ideas go to die. <laughs> now, I'm a Democrat. The Republicans are our adversaries. The Senate is the enemy. <laughs> um, if only it weren't true. I mean, sorry, Senators. We have some great allies uh, in the Senate, but not enough. And so they pulled, they left some of the provisions in. Like I have a provision uh, that requires the US Geological Survey to go out and find all these private sites where we might see PFAS contamination, because the military sites are just scratching the surface. All those other sites are really important. But we need to know where they are in order to deal with the threat. And there were a few other pieces. Uh, quick, uh, quicker phase out of the use of uh, PFAS in firefighting foam and a whole series of things. But the two really transformational pieces that we wanted to have in were removed by the Senate. And then in the process of negotiating a House and Senate compromise, um, the Senate prevailed. And we didn't get those two pieces in. We then went to the House, passed a comprehensive PFAS bill. It doesn't get us everything we want, but included those two essential elements and others. It's the PFAS Action Act that passed the House, but you know that's like a get well card. It doesn't really get anybody the help they need. It expresses our sentiments about PFAS. What we need is the Blue Cross card. We need something that can actually get us the care and the treatment that we need. And so the struggle in the next several months is going to be to revisit the question that we failed to succeed on in the last defense bill and either get it in a spending bill or the next defense bill or some other piece of legislation that's going to the president's desk. Interestingly enough, and you know, no sense being coy about it, the president's not with us on this and has been really antagonistic toward the issue of PFAS. You can ask yourselves why, but this town is usually a battle of interests. So figure out which interests benefit from us not regulating PFAS, and you answer all the questions that you need to pose. We need to overwhelm that. And whether it is the fight for clean drinking water or against thyroid disease or birth defects or cancer, if we don't deal with the environmental threats that cause those diseases, that cause those conditions, our job is made harder, your job is made harder. We're all in the same battle. We're all in the same fight. 
This is not about a chemical. This is about human beings. So, <coughs> excuse me, that's where we stand. And that's where I think your voices can really make a difference because, the, like I said, and I'll finish with this, and then if there's a question or two, I'll take them. The only way we've ever been able to do anything in this town or in any other democratic forum is by mobilizing public sentiment and moving beyond whatever the particular argument is that might move me to act. Because if I'm, you know, I'm a, people just think of me as like the drinking water guy. I mean, if you gotta be a guy. <laughs> Clean drinking water is not a bad handle. But if you are the cancer prevention person, this is your fight, you know? If you're the environmental justice advocate, this is your fight. If you're about the sustainable development fight to keep us from moving away from where we've already built and contaminated into other spaces, this is your fight. So let's, let's argue with those who are in the way, not based on you know, what was the initial question, and that is the Defense Department contaminating drinking water, but let's talk about it in the context of the things that go well beyond typical partisan or ideological divides. And cancer is one of those things. It touches everybody. It touches everybody without warning. And we all have an obligation to do everything we can to prevent it. And dealing with this terrible threat would be a really big step forward. So thank you. Yes, Mindy. There, there are. In fact, that's one of the provisions that we want to try to work into either the next defense bill or another must-pass bill. I mean, passing these bills through the House with the current configuration we have in the Senate means it's unlikely that as a standalone we're going to get these bills through. Uh, but I think we made a good case, even though it didn't come to fruition. By the time we were done with the Defense Authorization Act negotiations, some of the people who should have been stronger allies at the outset in the House and stood stronger and fought harder came to understand exactly how significant this threat is. This is where information is really powerful. And like your voices would really be powerful the next time we, we go through this. You know, it's, it is true. The one thing that we can't, we can't let the administration off the hook. Because right now, the Defense Department has it completely within its authority to pursue really aggressive cleanup of the contamination that they're responsible for. There's nothing that prevents them from initiating cleanup and coming to us. In fact, at one point in time, about a year ago, we were working to get more money in the, def uh, in, in the appropriations bills for cleanup, and the appropriators went to the Air Force and they said, well, well we, we really don't need it. We were ready to give them money. They didn't even want it. That has to change. And then, frankly, uh, the Environmental Protection Agency has it within its authority to bring forward a drinking water standard. They keep talking about it, but talk is cheap, especially where I come from. Um, I think we ought to have an agency whose um, task is to be a, a protector of the environment, like maybe an environmental protection agency. <laughs> Good idea. Good yeah. Idea. <laughs> anyway, unless there's one quick one, I know you got a lot of other stuff to get to. All right. Thank you all. All right. Thank you very much.